All right, I'm here with Kashif Khan, CEO of the DNA Company. Welcome to the show, man. Awesome. Great to be here, man. Hey, I am super excited to introduce you to everybody in the audience. You know, about, what, a month or two ago, we connected, and I said, hey, man, like, I'm all about, I'm a health and wellness guy. I geek out on this stuff. But I said, here's my only issue with DNA. I'm like, DNA is great. Like, and one of my naturopath mentors, he uses this phrase where he says, hey, DNA loads the gun, but your environment pulls the trigger. So I always think, well, as long as I maintain a healthy lifestyle, like, what does it matter if I know my DNA? And then you started going off explaining. You started giving me all this great information, and you started just looking at physical features of my face, and you said, I bet I could guess a lot of things about you just by looking at your face, and you were 100% right. So <laughs> I can't wait to share this episode and kind of uh, share with the audience just some of the things that you guys are doing at the DNA Company. And um, yeah, I, 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 you're making me a believer again that, hey, DNA matters. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to dive into your actual results and expose you to the world. <laughs> and, and really, it's like it's a genetic, the genetic world has, in terms of genetic condition, meaning I'm bored with it. You got it, right? And that means you really, regardless of environment or lifestyle load, that condition exists. So that's where genetics have sort of flourished in the medical world. The gap has been the stuff that you're not born with, like diabetes or cholesterol issues or whatever. Exactly to your point, unless you do the wrong thing, it's not going to express as a disease. So you may have a suboptimal cellular structure here, arterially, right? Which means you're more prone to disease, but have the right lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing is going to happen. But the, the, the gap or the trick has been that those choices aren't the same for everybody. Right? And how we even perceive them is different. And that's actually where we're going we're gonna to start with you, is with your brain and decode the way you think. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and then uh, people can figure out how to clone, the, clone you and become uh, like you. Superhuman. Uh, yeah. or, or not. Uh, so, yeah, everybody that doesn't know, about uh, eight, eight weeks ago, I embarked on the journey. I had my DNA ran by the DNA company, and this will be the first time everyone's going to hear live what my we're going to go over my results and you're going to kind of show hey this is what a typical consult would look like and kind of can share some of the insights that we're going to unravel here for the first time about yeah. my dna so as we um, go through i'm going to be reading uh your raw data so you you would have received reports that are, are already interpreted meaning they speak to the conditions anxiety weight loss you know sleeping all the various things you want to know about so our ai scrapes the data and populates the report and tells you, here's what you got, here's what you should do about it, here's how you should do that, right? What I'm looking at is literally the raw data to sort of interpret it as we go along so that we can dive a little deeper into the science. So if we start with the brain, the area we look at first is uh, reward and pleasure. So DRD2 is a gene that determines how dense your dopamine receptors are. So when you have that either pleasure or reward experience, to what degree do you experience it? And we find that most people are, are on one end or the other, meaning that they either have maximum receptors where for them it's just very easy. And then there's people like myself who have very sparse or almost slim to none receptors where it's very hard to experience. Mm. Then there's an enzyme called COMPT, which is deployed to clear that chemical out and bring you back to normal. And it comes at different uh, sort of fast, medium, slow, right? So if we look at that combo, you have right in the middle dopamine receptor. So as they should be, which leans more towards uh, sparse than it does dense. Uh, and you have the fast uh, comp. So that means that you're one degree away. So it's looking here, highest comp activity. Oh, sorry, the lowest comp. So you have a very slow comp. So you're, you're, you're pleasure or reward experience is going to be somewhat of a Zen experience, meaning that you're not going to chase reward. You're also not going to be sort of flaky and aloof. So the person that has the maximum receptors, it's very hard to get their interest because everything kind of gets some satisfaction anyway. So everything's yeah. good, right? They're in a meeting, <laughs> 10 things happen. They say, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'll take care of it. They never even start eight of them because they just don't feel the need to. But the two that they really get that hit from, that dopamine hit, they'll binge on it and they'll get lost in it because they so rarely feel that additional hit. Then there's people on the other end who have the minimum where 
they're gonna like every single thing you talk to them it's like adhd like yes 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 because they're constantly <laughs> that hit and that feeling reward they never get it yeah right so when they do get it they pursue it and then it's very easy to pull them in another direction so because your comp is really slow that it, that experience lasts a long time mm. so you may get lost in it so it's like here's a new show on netflix yeah it's okay but when you find the one you like you'll watch six episodes yeah that's right? about right <laughs> yeah because it, it's that pleasure hit it lasts a long time for you and so you tend to binge on that thing which also means you will ignore the other stuff so the stuff that you're not interested in right so and which makes you good at what you do because you're focused right it's it's there's distractions hey you want to work on this project this project no a guy like me is going to say yes to everything <laughs> right so i need people around me to create that structure to actually get stuff done whereas you can filter it through on your own and pick and choose and, and do what's actually valuable right so now we lay and we'll, we keep building a story so we layer on top of that adder to be adder to be is your ability it actually determines how your noradrenaline receptor, which deals with fear, trauma, pain. So call it your PTSD response. And you're slightly dysregulated there, which means that you're more likely to hold the grudge, hold on to the pain, remember things emotionally. Yeah. Right? So God forbid there's a car accident or a fight or whatever. You're going to pick up where you left off last time. Oh, not this again. Right. And the other person will be like, what are you talking about? This has nothing to do with last time. And because your comp is also the same enzyme clears this neurochemical also. So not only are you remembering the feeling, you're also remembering all the details because you, it just lasts a long time. You're in that moment for much longer. Right. So again, car accident, you might not want to look at a car for the next two months. Right. Yeah. And you remember that color car or that that intersection or you probably might even avoid that intersection on your on your drive. Right. That type of thinking, because you're literally imprinting the negative stimuli and you're you're using that as your filter for future thought, which negative call it PTSD positive. There's this emotional intelligence about things is wisdom. You know, that you won't make the same mistake twice because you can feel it coming. You can feel oh, that guy screwed me. I'm done. Yeah. Right. What gene is this? I'm going to have you say the same thing you just said. I'm going to go get my wife and have you explain it to her. Why? Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> why? Maybe I might just be resisting sometimes and I hold on yeah. to something. So it's called ad adder to be. So it really has to do with <laughs> adrenaline. Ah. Right. And the, the most studied and, you know, where the, the phenotype or the physical manifestation is most documented is it's in, in this, which is that negative imprint of stimuli call it emotional recall right an imprint so adrenaline we also know speaks to that rush right your desire or ability to pursue uh something that's exciting you know the feeling you get from it so you'll only do that in the things that you enjoy which would even further lead to binging activity because you'll get lost in it so these things compound right yeah yeah. For that specific gene, I'm just curious because you guys have done a lot of research. Do you see that gene? Um, do you see it being, I guess, blunted is the way the best way I can think of it in people like first responders, police officers, Navy SEALs? Mil is it where it's like the PTSD effect that imprint is less in them? I'm just curious if you. Yeah, so we we've, we've actually done work with the Black Ops and Special Forces to tell them who should actually be deployed or not. Wow. Yeah. So there's people that get through all the physical and, and there's the personal desire to get to a certain level, but they maybe haven't actually experienced combat and don't know what's about to come, right? So we literally work with them to say, well, what if that person is at greater risk? First of all, if someone is fully dysregulated, there's three versions of this gene. You're in the middle, right? But that middle expresses as like 60 to 70%. It's not middle. Right? Because of if the somebody slow, is because fully, of the comp gene, right? Because of the slowness. Yes, the, also the yeah. strong, so that's compounding it also. But the person who's fully dysregulated has both versions of the suboptimal. Uh, we would suggest they never that, that PTSD. It's guaranteed PTSD. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. So we we consult on this with military and even with, uh, for example, career planning. Like we'll talk to, you know, healthcare systems about surgeons who are dentists like, why is there so much suicide in dental and these types of things because they just can't handle 
You know, there's certain people that, yeah, planning my career was one thing, but when I actually got into the work, right, and the ability to just walk away from that trauma, some people can't do it. Yeah. Right? Wow. So now we layer on top of that your serotonin response. So serotonin is your mood regulator. So whereas what we just spoke of was how do you remember it, uh, serotonin is how do you experience it, like in the moment. And you're also slightly dysregulated there. So you have the shorter version of that serotonin receptor, which means that, call it, it would express as irritability, you know, things poke at me. Oh, what's that guy? That guy, the way he's chewing, I just can't stand it, you know? <laughs> Uh, somebody shows up late to a meeting it's like this guy has no respect you know uh, that kind of stuff uh because you, because your serotonin dysregulated it's like every little nuance and detail pokes at you right so again you're in the middle which ex is it, it expresses as middle plus you're in the middle which makes it more functional in nature where somebody like yourself in your role you you're you've you've sort of used it as a superpower meaning that because every little nuance and detail pokes at me, that could either be debilitating or I become, you know, uh, what people walk around on eggshells around me and I can't work. Yeah. Or it's like I see the things that nobody else sees. So I make these deep, wise decisions because of my advert to be, you can't screw me twice. Right. Yeah. I remember all the problems and I'm going to use that in future decision making. But I also see all the details and I'm binging. So it's like this tunnel vision. If I only do what I like because of my dopamine, I'm not I, the rest of it. I'm literally going to flake out, even though I said I'm just not going to do it. So you tend to, as your career evolves, get more to this focus. You're going to bring back the weight of all the previous problems, and you're also while you're down this tunnel, see all all these little details that poked at you that nobody else caught, right? Which makes you this great entrepreneur in a different way. So I'm an entrepreneur because I'm highly reward seeking. So I take big, stupid risks and I'll, I'll invest in things and be in, you know, work on a genetic testing company when I have no business doing that. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so there's different ways to get down. And this is why you see there's different types of entrepreneurs, right? But, but th th there's so these profiles that lead to, but it could also lead to something else if you channel it the wrong way. Yeah. That's fascinating. Right? I mean, I could see, obviously, like you said, it could fuel me. It could be the fire that fuels me. Yeah which I think it does. And now I, but one of the things you pointed out, I could also see, you know, uh, I have a seven year old and a four year old. And so sometimes I can, the poking, when you said the word poke, that really <laughs> resonated with me because I can let them kind of get to me when I, yeah. when I lose, start to lose control. Right. When I'm like, Hey, do this. And then it doesn't happen. I yeah. get like, oh, and, right. And with serotonin, you're actually perceiving it as real. Right. So it's not like, that thing uh, that's you don't know that, hey, I've experienced more than the guy next to me. You actually think that that experience is as you're experiencing it. So that additional annoyance or stimuli, or whatever, that's the level of the thing the thing is happening at, whereas the people around you are experiencing it a little bit down here. Mm -hmm. And so because you perceive it as real, you're going to treat it as real and you're going to act and you're going to be as bothered as you should be as if it were real. So one other thing with that is that with serotonin dysregulation, because it's kind of call it this bipolar response. It's not only the negative, it's also the positive. It's very easy to get you right back up to laughing and joking and then irritated and then back up, right? Bouncing yeah. up and down. So yeah. it's re the response to stimuli, right? Being drawn in directions. So you also, it could lead you towards a coping mechanism, meaning that whenever I'm bothered or annoyed, I tend to want that food or that snack or that drink or that TV or that whatever, right? Because your body, your brain wants to get back to a happy state. And the easiest way to do that is whatever your happy thing is. It's usually food for people, right? Yeah, you know, and really quick on that, can um, when one of the COMT that comp gene, um, I love coffee, I love yeah. caffeine. I don't need it though. I don't need it to like function. I need a cup in the morning to keep me going. But I've noticed, man, I can drink a lot of coffee and have no effect. But I mean, I built yeah. up that tolerance. But I'm wondering, does that have anything also to do with caffeine drinkers or anything like that? The so there's actually a gene that. Uh, determines how quickly you metabolize coffee and there's some people that like myself if i have coffee at 4 p.m i can't sleep that night yeah because i'm an ultra right like after. ultra slow yeah metabolizer but somebody like yourself you probably get through it really quick 
right? So but it's that like has nothing to do with comp. I was just curious. That has nothing to do with the uh, not comp. No, no, it's a different process. gene which is in the okay. panel. We can. I'll get into that. We we, we, okay. we actually do test for that gene. We actually use it for. And so this is where again going back to what we said in the last time we spoke that that siloed approach of this gene means this, this gene means that. That's not the way the body works. So that same gene we actually use it to look at hormones. But it also happens to metabolize coffee, right? So anyway, so that's we'll get into that. So the the last brain chemical uh, is BDNF, brain derived neurotropic factor, uh, and you have the optimal expression there. So what does that mean? The primary purpose of BDNF, which we hear about in these sort of biohacking circles all the time, is neuroplasticity, right? So that those neural connections, and you do a really good job there. So what does that mean? I can hit you on the head. You'll probably recover from your concussion pretty quick. <laughs> Thank you. Right? <laughs> oh, that's uh, why I've it, been able to do so good. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> All those years of boxing and martial arts and stuff. No yeah, so you, you're you exact prime candidate to taking that hit to the head. First of all, it's very tough for you to even get a concussion. And if you did, you'd cover recover like that, right? Mm. But it also speaks to mood and behavior uh, in terms of that – call that drama queen response, which you don't have, you would be the flip opposite, okay. right? So I feel, I remember the problems, right? Because of my neurodrama response, the things bother me in the moment, but it doesn't mean a lot, mm. right? So it's not like you're going to slam a door and yell and walk out of the room. You're going to talk about it. You're going to comment it. You notice it, but you're going to move on, right? Because the, that weight isn't there. So you hold the grudge, you feel the thing, you notice it all, but you can get through it. So it's, it's more functional. And again, this is what makes you entrepreneurial because you, you experience it all, but you don't carry the weight of it because you can get through it quickly because your BDNF and your neural, your neural synapses are so well connected. Right? So, so that's one thing. The other thing is your ability because you develop neural connection so well, it's very easy for you to develop new skills. So think of that scientist that like sits in the room, tunnel vision, and that's all they do. And if you tell them, hey, do you want to work on this? They're like, I don't do that. I'm a PhD in this, yeah. right? Versus that entrepreneur is like, yeah, I'll learn this. And then I'll take a course on this. And I'll do the end to a high level. Like you'll actually execute at a decent level, right? So your ability to shift gears and learn new skills, um, it's, it's really high. And that's, that's what allows you to sort of lead what you do. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I, and you're 100% right. I uh, I don't slam doors. I'm almost very stoic. If there's an argument, I'm just very like, okay, I'm, yeah. very, I'm like taking it all in um, and I'll kind of process it later, but uh, I don't get riled up. I'm very like almost detaching from the incident, very yes. like compartmentalizing my emotions, which can be good, can be bad. It just depends yeah. on the situation. And that's exactly it. So you're, it, it, it creates this great leadership profile. Right, because you can you can handle the other thing. How does that guy do it? Oh, it's so stressful. How does he? This is how. You have this great ability to deal with neural connection. Just plow through whatever it is. You feel it. You notice it. You, it the, the pain is even there. It's just not a weight, right? Yeah, love that. So so that was your brain. Now, why did we talk about the brain first? Because that also is how you perceive everything else. So when we talk about sleep, when we talk about exercise, when we talk about this is how you think. So I can't tell you how many times when we've done clinical reviews with people like executives that say, hey, I want to pay you five, ten, twenty thousand dollars, like just figure everything out, right? Give me all your top scientists. Before we even talk to them, we map out their brain because the way we talk to them is different based on how we have people that we know that the first 10 minutes is just going to be them telling us why we're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's That's literally just 10 minutes of the, like, I noticed, you know, before we start, I noticed this and this and this and this and this, and I'm kind of concerned, and we already know that that's coming. Yeah. Right? And then we have people where we know we need to slow down because they're just, they're going to, they're not going to go into any depth. They're not going to just, like, they, they give it to me and I'm going to do it, even if it hurts me and kills me. Right? And they're not going to measure, they're not going to track, they're just going to do, 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 and everything in between. Right? So... We typically start with the brain for that purpose. So I'm, I'm going to now look at your cardiovascular health. And the way we look at cardiovascular health is not uh, genetic risk, meaning that there's typically, hey, you took a DNA test, you got an 80% chance of cholesterolemia, 80% chance of heart disease, right? 
I'm South Asian ancestry. Hey, you're brown, you got a bigger chance of heart disease. That's yeah. typically what you hear genetically. We look at the Cause genetics she's... of the hardware. Why does right. heart disease even happen? It doesn't just one day tick, there's a problem, right? That's not how you get heart disease. And we all know this. It's just 10, 15, 20 years of making the wrong choices. And I'm talking about chronic disease. I'm not talking about a genetic trait like a valve problem or something. The big ones, cholesterolemia, arterial health, right? Like blockages. You weren't born with those things. Your artery wasn't blocked at the age of two. It happened at 50 or 55 because <laughs> that's how many years you had to do everything wrong to cause that problem. Yeah. Right? So we now look at what is your innate capacity to deal with those wrong choices. And then we're going to look at what are the right and wrong choices for you. And this will speak to most disease. We just put it in the context of cardiovascular. Because uh, first of all, this could go on for four hours if we wanted it to. Right. Uh, you know, with second, it just it speaks to mo most other diseases which are rooted in inflammation. You have to have good, healthy cells which are not inflamed, and then you won't have disease. So when we look at your profile, there's something called 9P21, which is a gene locus. It's a location that determines what quality of endothelial lining you have. So that inner lining of the artery that the blood actually touches and flows through that cell membrane you have the not so good version. So in the two lo locations that we look for, oh, one is medium and one is poor, which means that you have like sort of paper thin endothelial uh, cellular structure, which is more prone to inflammation. Oh, so remember, again, that doesn't mean you're sick. We're just going to park that for a second and then look at the rest. Where you're doing well is the APOE, which is lipid transport. So, you know, your ability to deal with Cholesterol email, your better, uh, sorry, uh, cholesterol transport, your ability to utilize uh, mutated proteins and get rid of them to avoid Alzheimer's and, de and dementia, you're doing really well there. So that hardware, you actually have the best version. Good. Uh, more MCT, more bulletproof MCT oil for me then. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get into that also. We're going to look oh. at your fat metabolization. Oh boy. Uh, so now your actual arteries so the ability to dilate not so good and the ability to deal with hypertension or blood flow also not so good not the worst but not so good so now what yeah. we know is you have not so good endothelial really high propensity towards inflammation you're going to have blood pressure problems which may compound that right but right now you're healthy because you're doing everything right and you're also at the right age so let's look at now what are the things that would cause that inflammation and i'm going to go to your detox profile. So this is the one of the things that we look at very uniquely where most genes you're looking for what's called like a SNP, like a spelling mistake, right? There's a variation that points to something. In the detox genes so glutathionization, your ability to use glutathione, bind onto toxins, send them to the liver to metabolize and keep your system clean. Uh, those genes, you could actually have what's called a copy number variation, meaning forget about what version, you don't even have the gene. Didn't get it. So I don't right. find I, glutathione. I don't do well. So I'm going to look at that now. Oh, okay. Uh, and yeah, so your the GSTT1, which would deal with call it uh, the detox of fatigue, meaning that you know if you were to breathe in some chemicals or if you were to overwork yourself, you know, exercise really hard and getting clearing that oxidation, you're actually missing one of the genes. So mom or dad, one of them didn't give it to you. Damn them. So you're at like 50% capacity. GSTM1, detox of the gut, that first line of defense of the gut lining, you're also missing a copy. So you're at 50% capacity. So the ability to, you know, pesticides, mold on food, whatever, it's your suboptimal there. So I don't, you probably feel it. Like if you don't eat properly, your gut just doesn't feel right. Yeah, I, I eat pretty well, um, but, you know, maybe I don't have a, a good awareness there. I noticed in the past when I would drink uh, beer or wine or something like that, I would have – I noticed more reactions for me. Then yeah. I just assume it was like a histamine or yeast issue, which you're – you know, who knows, yeah. Yeah, so literally you're – that first line defends the gut. You're missing 50% of the soldiers, right? So the ability to – whatever you're throwing at your gut – and you're young enough where it, it hasn't turned into anything and you're also doing things right. But take this profile and plug the average American diet into it. They're getting crushed. Colitis, Crohn's, you know, leaky gut, all these types of things, right? Yeah. So sure. now 
we're going to look at GSTP1, which is here, first line. And you're also not doing well there. So your ability to, yeah, your ability to deal with, call it, uh, you know, if you walk into a factory with chemicals or there's mold, for example, you know, uh, perfumes, even going golfing and breathing in the pesticides from the, the grass. The glyphosate. Sorry? The glyphosate, right? The yeah, the glyphosate, yeah. Yeah. All that stuff. So anything airborne, you don't do such a good job of, again, defending your body from that stuff. So it enters the bloodstream. And because your GSTT, that first gene that we said uh, deals with the fatigue and all that, is also at 50% capacity, it's compounded. Because not only is it getting in, but it's also not being cleared. Mm. So this points to a profile where you are creating that load that leads to free radical and chemical activity in the blood that would eventually start to cause inflammation here. And we're surprised at the numbers, but we've been doing this for a while. It's not like a two or three percent problem. This is like a thirty percent problem. Yeah. You know, one in three people that we talk to look like this. In fact, it's probably even higher than that, but it's at, it's at least thirty percent. Uh, so now, one more detox gene we're going to look at is saw two. So your ability. Just real, so just real quick, I wanted to ask you. Sorry, on uh, me, and I know we'll probably get to it later, but you just brought up the point. You were talking about airborne chemicals, aerosols. Yeah. And then my and then the heart and ability to not clear it. Now I'm of course I'm thinking about this virus that's plagued us the last two years. Based on that, and I know we can get deeper into it, uh, which we'll talk about. But when you look at just that profile, the detox profile in the heart, would I be a high candidate risk, I guess, for COVID or or is that yeah, not, so is that, is that not the COVID, barometer you would use? So we've actually built an algorithm for uh, risk severity, risk of severity, meaning that. Um, how sick are you going to get? And your profile, what we've seen so far. So COVID, the virus is, a, is you know, call it a flu, right? Yep. COVID, the disease, arterial inflammation, respiratory inflammation, which is what puts you in the hospital. So, yes, you're at much greater risk of cardiac inflammation. Just based so if on you get to that point looking, where. Yeah. yeah. So if you get to that point where you cross that threshold, where it gets to the heart and you will suffer from more inflammation, right? So that, but the, because you're so healthy, meaning you've taken care of yourself, you probably haven't crossed that threshold where it would put you in the hospital. Yeah. Take your profile and add the, again, the typical American diet and exercise to it. Even though there's no symptomology or disease, you're, you would be so the, the metabolic inflammation state that you would be in, you would just need that trigger to push you over the edge. And that's why you have these people that are seemingly healthy, like, oh, there was nothing wrong. They go to the gym, they whatever. But everything they're also doing, environment, nutrition, lifestyle-wise, they're already at 70% capacity of, of what they've been doing to themselves and their inability to deal with it. And they just needed that thing to push them to 80%, 90%, which puts them in the hospital. Yeah, right. amazing. Typically, it's getting to the age of 50 or 55 where you've just done it for long enough. COVID will like you know be the catalyst that gives you that 20 years – you know, and, and the other area that I was just going to get into, your SOD2 is your mitochondrial clearance, your ability to clear at the mitochondrial level, antioxidation. You're also not doing so well there. That's highly implicit in COVID. So that load, so COVID, the load on your cells, that gets highly compounded when you're already not able to maintain cellular health. And for you, that's a challenge. So SOD2 is that gene that helps you clear oxidants for the cells, so your mitochondria is where you take oxygen and nutrition and create energy, which also means you're creating oxidants. You're converting oxygen into oxidants, which are toxic, right? Uh, and you, you're like minus 40% capacity of clearing that stuff. Okay, now I'm freaking out. Tell me, what do I get? <laughs> what do I, what, do, what, give me a pill, give me something. What do, so hopefully at the end, you're going to tell me the good news this that... would be recommended. <laughs> so that's the good news here. And this is the challenge with genetics. You know, we used to hear a lot like, I don't want to know, right? I don't want to know because it's just going to give me anxiety. I'd rather just, you know, that I'm going to drop dead one day and just still happen. So we have, we don't speak of anything where we also don't know what to do about it. So everything that I've told you, we also know exactly what to tell you to prevent the problem. That's awesome. Because if, you, if you've understood 
genetically what's happening at the root cause level, you understand the biochemistry of it, it's very easy to determine what to now provide for that problem, not for the symptom, the thing that happens 10 years later. Yeah. Like, why We don't need to give you, so for example, your combination, I don't detox, so I take in toxins, they're in my blood, both from mitochondrial and external, so internal and external. So there's going to be this load. I have poor endothelial health, so it's probably prone to inflammation. If I do things like cardiovascular exercise, creating more oxidants, breathing in chemicals, so the load just got higher, so the inflammation got worse. My body's response to inflammation here is to actually deploy cholesterol as a hormone to reduce it. And when cholesterol meets toxicity, it hardens against positive, which is the beginning of cholesterolemia. Mm -hmm. So why I mention this is that the solution to cholesterolemia is Lipitor, a pill, a statin, right? So what we said is if we understand the biochemistry of why this happens, which is what I just described, we can fix that yeah. as opposed to here's the statin. Right. So, and this is the difference between genetics and functional genetics is, hey, Joel, you have these problems. You're probably going to need to stay ahead of cholesterolemia and get on a statin. This early. is like if you go to 23andMe, this is like the basic data you're going to get. Yeah, you're going to be told propensity, risk profile, 80% chance of this, 60% chance of that, right? And then take that to your doctor who's going to treat it in the doctor way, which right. is okay. If you've got a greater risk for cholesterolemia, get on the treadmill, eat like this, and let's take a drug in five years. Well, guess the treadmill is the thing causing it, by the way. <laughs> right, right. Because you don't have more oxidative stress. Yeah. yeah, more oxidative stress, right? So what we're saying is we understand the biochemistry of the thing, so we'll deal with that. Right. So now if we look at, uh, so we've understood now your detox profile. Now I'm going to quickly scan through your methylation or your anti-inflammatory profiles. Now that we know that there's inflammation happening in you less like less likely because of the way you live. Uh, let's look at how you deal with that inflammation. The first red flag I see is that your ability to deal with, uh, vegan foods is slim to none. Right. So you as a vegan, you would be sick. Yeah. Right. So the enzyme activity required to break down beans, lentils, proteins, etc. You can't live off of that stuff. You can eat it, but it can't be a staple. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to scan through. The, the one red flag that I see. So what is, I mean, methylation is really driven by B vitamins, like your anti-inflammatory response. The one thing that I see when I look is your fuck too, the same gene that deals with your ability to break down enzymes from like beans, lentils, etc. also determines how well you metabolize B12 in the gut. And you don't do that so well. Meaning that if you take your typical B12 supplement from the store, you don't metabolize it. You don't use it. Right? So for you, uh, you need to take a sublingual under the tongue. And it's very important for you, particularly this one little thing. So again, going about back to my brown ancestry, I live in a city called Mississauga, which is predominantly South Asian, Indian, Pakistani, Bengali, Afghani, that type of thing. Uh, and we have the biggest heart center in Canada because we're told brown people genetically have bad hearts, mm. right? We do mostly pass away from heart disease and diabetes. So we looked at this genetically and there's nothing wrong with the heart. They're ac we're actually doing really well there. Where we're not doing well is exactly what I just described for you, the poor endothelial lining, right? Now combine that with our inability. So ancestrally, South Asian people didn't eat beef. Economically, religiously, for many reasons, they ate goat or lamb as opposed to beef. The B12 yeah. that comes from goat or lamb is pre-methylated. It's metabolized in a different way. So we don't have the genetics to break down B12 from beef. So now all of a sudden living in North America, okay, your B12 levels are low, go take this pill. Yeah. Guess what? We can't use that pill. So really, this if we did one thing, and I went door to door in Mississauga to all the brown people and said, start taking a sublingual B12 in a specific version, how much of that heart disease would go away? It's an in, it's wow. an inflammation problem. It's not a heart problem. Right. Right. But inflammation for so many years or decades leads to a cholesterol problem, or it could express itself in different ways. Yeah. Right? You just need to deal with the inflammation. Yeah. So now, uh, 
Other than that, your methylation profile looks okay. Uh, the B12 is what sticks out in that specific version. Um, methylcobalamin, right? Like a sublingual methylcobalamin? Uh, not, uh, sorry, let me see. Yeah, you would actually do well with the methylcobalamin. Some people don't. Some people, we have to tell them to take an adenosyl. They literally don't do well with the methylcobalamin. They will end up giving them headaches, and it just doesn't even help them. Um, but for you, it, it would actually work. Cool. Right? Uh, so now I'm going to look at your diet and metabolism to understand how you should eat. So the first thing that sticks out is your ability to feel satiety. Like, I, I've eaten enough. Not there. <laughs> so going for seconds, thirds, overloading the plate. Yeah. That's who you are. Right? And to an extreme. So you really have to apply logic to your food, especially if you consider your behavioral genomics and your ability to binge. To binge, yeah. So if you find something that you like and you have access to it, you're going to overeat. Right? Yeah, so you have I to really to, think I about that. I can do that with a bag of tortilla chips. I've been known to do that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's very easy for you to binge on food and overeat. Uh, where you're doing well is the satiation, like so your mouth gets satisfied. It's easy for you to deal with that. You know, I don't need to snack. I don't need my chips and chocolate in between the meals. You make might make it part of the meal, like I'm eating my food and I'm not done and I'm going to eat the bag of chips too. But there's no not much snacking in between. You do a good job there, right? Uh, your fat metabolization is optimal. So yes, you are a great candidate for a keto diet. And not everyone is, by the way, but you are. So you burn through fat as fuel really well. Where you're not doing well is your starch metabolization. So both your insulin response, your ability to take starches, break it down into glucose, you're not doing so well. Your ability to then trigger the proper insulin response, you're also not doing so well. So if you were, again, on a starch diet, bread, rice, pasta, white sugar, you would almost guaranteed end up with type 2 diabetes. Wow. Yeah. So for you, uh, paleo, keto, like, you know, conventional greens, get your carbs, but not your starches, right? Yeah. Reduce the starches. Uh, have your meats. You can go ahead and eat as much fat as you want, so long as you're not combining the fats with starches. Because your body struggles so much with starches, it probably won't get to the fats. Yeah, and so that's interesting. I mean, for the most part, that's how I've eaten the last probably 10 years, is right. what you just said, even longer. Is a yeah. paleo keto style, you know, fasting here and there in between. Um, I do have starches, but you know, it's not the bulk of my yeah, diet. Yeah, and you have to stick to that. And you, like we said, you're in a unique position where you're doing things right. For the most part, this is the difference between disease or no disease for somebody. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many people are on that sort of tipping point where we catch them on time, or they're in the early stages of something, and then they call us and say, "Well, what happened here?" And we're actually able to reverse. So somebody all of a sudden is diabetic and taking insulin. We can get them off. Yeah, Happened so many that's times. Huge. Wow. Right? Because we so deal cool. with the root cause. So, okay. So now, um, so we've looked at that. Now we're going to look at, you probably already know you're not a lactose metabolizer. Yeah. Right? So stay away from it. It's going to give you crazy gut inflammation. Uh, you're, I, I'm guessing you don't get sick often, like the common cold, flu, right? Your, no, your vitamin C response is super optimal, so it's actually challenging for you to get sick. Uh, it's just you do so well there. Where you're not doing well is vitamin D. Hmm. So your ability to draw vitamin D from the sun and from foods and put it into the blood, good. If you go to the doctor, they'd probably tell you your vitamin D levels are great. Where you're not doing well is transport. So even though you have enough in your blood, you're not using it fast enough uh, to actually get it. So the transport means your ability to take it from the blood where it's first step where it arrives and then move it to the cell where it's actually used. To all the various cells all over your body. You don't do that well. Mm. So your cells aren't getting enough of the vitamin D that's in your blood and you end up, you know, it goes, it's not water soluble, you end up storing in fatty tissue. And if you have too much, that can actually be a problem, uh, a reason for fat retention. So your whole vitamin D profile doesn't look good. So what does that mean? Uh, you likely, where do you live, by the way? What city? So I, uh, I've been in California and San Francisco probably the last 
10 years and that's where I grew up most of my life. Now I'm in Idaho, but Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean that was only recently, so Okay, so now you're going to experience like a proper winter, yeah. right? So you're going to probably if you if you don't deal with the vitamin D properly, you're going to end up with mood issues in the winter, joint pains, brain fog, uh you probably will get sick which you never used to, you know. So vitamin D of the 22,000 genes in your body, 2,000 require vitamin D to function. So literally 10% of your biochemistry, which means if you if you're not there, this is why they call it the immunity in supplement, and people say, well, if you have enough vitamin D, COVID's not a problem, right? This is really what's happening: is that 10% of your what's going on in your body, these trillions of cells that are doing all these things, need vitamin D. Yeah, it's it's actually a hormone. It's not even a vitamin. I, I believe it's been rebranded as a vitamin because certain people don't want you to know it's a hormone, right? Yeah. And how important it is. But uh, so anyways, you don't transport it that well, which means you would likely, first of all, updose a lot compared to a normal person and split the dose. Because if I take, so this recommended dose is 1,000 IU. You probably need like 5,000. And in that 5,000. 5,000 in the morning. You take 5,000 in the morning? Yeah, I take 5,000 with a fat. I usually I can make a smoothie or either throw it in my bulletproof. Co it's a dropper. So I'll throw it in my coffee with bulletproof. Okay, perfect. Or I throw it in with like olive oil and like a smoothie. I usually throw five thousand um, right in the morning. And, that's that's the, and what I you're doing do is a, for like two years. Okay, so what you're doing is great. Now that you're in a different climate, what I would suggest is in the winter, you do that twice. So do it with breakfast and with lunch. Cool. And ten thousand seems like a lot, but you're going to need it in the winter. Yeah. Right. So that's the difference. And you can't take all 10,000 in the morning because even the 5,000 you're taking, you're probably utilizing 2,000 to 3,000 of it because mm. you can't transport it fast enough. Right? So, so that 10,000 that you would take in the winter is going to get you to five maybe. Right? The, the five that you need. So that's yeah. the difference for you. You need to take more in order to get a lesser amount. Uh, so now uh, vitamin A, so eye health. Again, your ability to activate beta carotene retinol, it's not the best. It's in fact, it's the worst. So that gradual, <laughs> yeah, the gradual decrease of eyesight over time. Uh, I had LASIK done many years ago too, so yeah. Okay, so you're gonna, I would suggest just supplementing heavily there because it's a con, you just, you don't activate it. So you need a lot more. Mm. Um, you're saying and, like vitamin A or uh, what about like omega threes, like the combination of the two or? Yeah, coffee, yeah, omega three also for your heart health, for the endothelial health, uh, vitamin A, beta carotene, all that stuff, you know. Uh, in fact, there's now some great eye health supplements that which didn't exist even five years ago. You used to have to piecemeal and put everything together. Now there's some formulators that have built uh, stuff that's specifically for prevention of, you know. Poor, eye, poor outcomes over time, which is basically this retinal you know, stuff. Yeah. So, so there, there, I can suggest a couple things to you by email, but cool. uh, there's a few of them now. Uh, okay, I'm going to look at your hormones now. And the hormones, we look at more of a map. And this is what, why most genetic, genetic testing companies actually don't report on hormones because each gene doesn't mean much. So each gene on its own doesn't give you an outcome. Or point to anything you have to look at the map and the flow so the cycle is the same for men as it is for women you take progesterone you convert it to estrogen or sorry to testosterone and then you convert that to estrogen and men do that daily we have a menstrual cycle women have a menstrual cycle right so in that cycle each step can be done to a different degree in a different direction and leads you to a different outcome so if i look at your profile what I see is that first step of I convert progesterone into testosterone, you do that very poorly. So the initial hormone pool is quite low. Then your ability to clear the testosterone as a clean androgen, like before it converts into DHT or estrogen, you don't do that also, which is good because you maintain that pool, that your pool is low. So it's good news that it stays for a decent amount of time. Mm. You then convert some of it into estrogen some of it into DHT and DHT is a manly man, like Superman hormones, which is like, uh, I have ripped muscles and a six pack. Yeah. So what you, in your profile, you, it's very easy to have this sort of 
ideal balanced body type. Call it the Captain America body type. Right? You're not Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> you're not you're not gonna get big and huge because yeah. you know the estrogens are okay, but they're not excessive. And you're also not gonna look like a NBA player that's like thin, but like you can see every little ripple. Mm -hmm. Right? You're somewhat in the middle, this ideal male body type. The only thing I would say is uh, the hormone levels are low to begin with. So you are a candidate for hormone therapy. Some people, we used to tell them never take BHRT, right, hormone replacement, because it can lead to prostate issues, it can lead to uh, breast issues, breast health issues, etc. Uh, in your case, because the hormone levels are low to begin with, uh, you do okay. In fact, you probably feel all of a sudden your muscles are a little stronger and bigger and uh, you know there's more vitality more energy libido would go up not that i'm saying you have a problem but yeah. it's you know it's the only in the red flags here we see is because you do have dht conversion and you don't clear it so well uh over time if you're having an androgen dominant lifestyle which i'm guessing you do you know there's a lot of training you're probably eating the right foods uh that could lead to prostate issues over time, mm. prostate enlargement. I, you know, so I would, if you're doing things that are pushing towards androgenization, like whether it's supplementation, hormone therapy, you know, constant heavy, uh, heavy weight training, that type of thing, yep. then you may want to consider blocking the DHT conversion because you want to avoid that prostate health issue. How would you block the DHT conversion? There's right? supplements that do it. So okay. th th this is the research we've been doing over time is it's not, hey, I can't sleep at night. Give me melatonin. It's yeah. why can't you sleep at night? And how do we either slow down or speed up that gene expression? So what are the ingredients that are studied to actually affect the expression of the gene that's causing you the problem? And this is a unique thing we do where we've actually been custom compounding for people here's your formula with the ingredients to the exact dose your body needs. Cause it, we've even seen that sometimes the same ingredient at one dose or another can speed up or slow down the same gene. Wow. Right. It's it's all the dosage itself determines what's actually going to happen with that result. So in your case, so there, there's stuff we can recommend to you that, you know, that do exactly this you can either slow down the DHT conversion or increase the clearance of it either way yeah um the good news is you're probably going to have a good head of beautiful head of hair for a long time you know balding <laughs> isn't going to be a problem you're going to have nice skin you're going to age with sort of uh you have both the outward estrogen and the inward vitality from the testosterone so you got them both going on you got this very balanced profile and a lot of the red flags that we usually speak to and for men which are you know libido hair loss uh, prostate issues which for you is a minor problem, very easy to manage. Um, skin issues like acne, etc. You don't have any of those red flags. That is correct. I do. Not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I got a little bit of graying of the hair. That's starting to as I'm. Yeah, and that's from going. the mitochondria, by the way. That goes back to what we said about saw two. Yeah. So because you're that you have this oxidative stress uh, load because you don't clear so well, that's what leads to rapid aging of cells including the hair the, the earlier graying and white like look at me i if i knew what i know now eight years ago this wouldn't have happened mm. I, i've now stopped it it's no longer progressing but this happened i'm 42 just turned 42 a couple weeks ago this shouldn't have happened it, it, now that we know why yeah Right. That's so huge. The the ability, the control that you can now take. You can, what you guys are yeah. doing. It's fascinating. You can literally control your aging because yeah. we know why it happens. You have to be proactive. So the thing with genetics is those are the cards you're dealt. So that's who you are. So it's not, there's no magic pill where, Hey, I'm going to take this thing and it's going to change. No, you have to keep taking the thing because as soon as you stop, it's like a, it's a boat with holes in it. You, if you unplug the, it's the water comes in, you got to constantly be shuffling the water out by counteracting either with supplementation, food, whatever it is, or reducing the load that's causing the problem, or a little bit of both. So it's gotta be a constant effort. Uh, I'm just gonna look at one more thing in your hormones. Cool. 
Um, so there is some estrogen toxicity. All right. And your clearance is somewhat medium. So the only other thing I would say is some of the other male concerns like testicular cancer, those types of things, minor, minor, but there is some risk poking through uh, because of the estrogen toxicity. And, and we have seen that in some men that this leads to uh, testicular health issues. Uh, but again, for you, we're speaking about this early enough and you're not going to create an estrogen load on your lifestyle where this would express into anything. You know, so we have people where we tell them we see breast cancer coming and they're like, no way, I'm so healthy, impossible. And then literally we've had patients, we had one of our investors actually, wow. who in their due diligence, they went through our science to see what are these guys all about? And we told them, we think that your wife is getting breast cancer actually very soon and we can actually help prevent it. And he actually spent $25,000 at this executive clinic uh, where they do the typical genetic tests. And they said that there's no genetic propensity towards breast cancer. So the typical, you know, genetic markers like BRCA and these things that they say lead to cancer, right? Yeah. So he actually didn't invest for that reason because he thought our science didn't work. His wife got breast cancer two months later. Wow. Yeah. Two, literally two months later. Why? Because we saw the estrogen toxicity and then we saw she didn't clear and we saw that she was menopausal. So what happens when you're estrogen toxic and you're menopausal, you no longer have a menstrual cycle. You don't clear. So your body starts to store this stuff in fatty tissue. Where do you have fatty tissue as a woman is in your breasts. Yep. What's in the breast that was never designed to deal with this level of toxicity, all those glands, in the breath so literally we could see it coming and on top of that she was a vegetarian religiously vegetarian so she ate a lot of tofu compounding that load right so anyway so this is where you can look at things functionally it is like 80 percent chance of breast cancer or why does breast cancer happen why does prostate cancer happen why does testicular cancer happen and then reverse engineer your path toward those things and eliminate the loads and add the things you need to do to reduce. It's so cool what you just said, because I just interviewed Dr. Mindy Peltz and she was talking about the same thing about breast cancer and how there's three different estrogens and she deals a lot with menopausal women because she was going through that and she said almost identical, the same stuff that you're saying, just the, she looks at it in a different way. But if you can manage those estrogen levels correctly and you see what's going on, yeah, and you can manage the toxicity like you're talking about. I mean, and she was saying just like you, we could wipe out breast cancer completely, you know, in, in certain for, like for, the, for that. The, the majority of it. So why do why does breast cancer consistently happen at the menopause age? Because of this. Yep. Right. There's other breast cancers also, which is not what we're talking about. Those are that goes back to the very first thing we said, genetic conditions. It's in your genes. There's a switch that's been turned on or off and it's coming. It's a matter of when you can there one day there'll be a genetic therapeutic that can turn that bad switch on or off and then you're not going to get it. But it's not about environment, nutrition, lifestyle load. But for the most part, it is. And for most diseases, for the most part, it is. Most chronic diseases are not things that have to happen. Yeah. You know, most rapid aging and poor health outcomes don't have to happen. Right. There, there is a percentage, and it's a very small percentage of disease, which is a genetic suboptimality that, that it's coming. Right, it's there, and but that's a very small part. So, so with all that you know, do you think uh, <clears throat> you're going to be able to get people like Dave Asprey and me to live till 180 years old? Yeah, <laughs> I think we're part of the equation. You know. Yeah, for sure. You are. What, what we there's two things we do. So we were having this discussion with another company that measures genetic expression. And they'll tell you kind of like your biological age and where they think you're at. And the discussion we had was, okay, they'll tell you what's going on, but we'll tell you why and what to do about it. Yeah. So those are very important pieces, meaning that, okay, are you gonna go on a keto diet to live to be 180? Well, are you a fat metabolizer? Is that really the right choice? Maybe it is, and that's good news. But what if it isn't? You're literally gonna eat yourself to the grave. Yeah. So it's a question of being able to make the right choices. Um, and we feel like um, everyone that we've dealt with, there's been this wow, aha moment 
of that's why you know oh that's that thing that pain point that they just couldn't figure out and having said that we've been dealing with people that their clinicians couldn't help them with which is what our research was we partnered with all these clinics we said just give us your problems and we'll try and figure them out right <laughs> wow. so in that aha moment that eureka thing when it happens it happens over and over and over again and now it becomes just about compliance and actually doing the thing we're talking about yeah. but at least now you know what to do yeah that's so huge just yes. real quick um based so based on what you told me so trt i could do that and probably wipe out all those other hormonal issues just by supplementing with with like a trt or what yeah I, I would say you just have to be a little careful where you don't want it. i mean so the 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 typical product that's given to man men is a horm uh, testosterone the thinking is you need more testosterone let's take more testosterone right yeah in your case uh, you do convert some of that testosterone into estrogen and your estrogen is toxic. So it, 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 we would be a little more custom about how it's dosed to you. I see. And you would probably need some supplements to mitigate the bookends of the toxic DHT and the toxic estrogen. So it's kind of like it's, it's, you need a, you need a more holistic approach to how you would do it, but there is a way you could do it healthily. Got it. But there's also a way you could do it where it's very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm glad you said that because so often TRT is all the rage right now and everybody's yeah. just, you know, libido's down. Um, they're feeling lethargic. They, they're gaining weight and they're, or they're overweight. They go see someone who's, uh, and then they, the doc says, yeah, your TR, your testosterone's in the 200s. Let's yeah. just give you testosterone. And I see that happen all the time, but their root cause issues are st still not fixed. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it doesn't, because the thinking is, we, we have an NHL hockey player who came to us because he had no libido, no energy, it was horrible. His coach had given him what's called an andro gel pack. You put it on your skin, it's an androgenized gel, and this testosterone enters your system. He had the ultra fast version of converting testosterone to estrogen. So all that testosterone they were giving him was just converting into estrogen. He got gynomastia. He grew man boobs. Oh. Literally, he grew man boobs. Libido went in the tank. Right, and, and their solution? Oh, he needs more. Right. We didn't give him enough. Right? So literally, I mean, he had some beautiful hair and skin for a couple months, <laughs> right? Yeah. But everything else fell apart. So we had to just change the protocol. And the goal was I need more testosterone, but the path was wrong. It's not give me more. It's maybe... Even the natural testosterone he already had was maybe enough. He just needed to stop converting it into estrogen. He didn't even need anything it added. He just needed a supplement to stop converting into estrogen. Yeah. Wow. Right. And so what did that? Did we just wrap up my profile? We're done, man. That's who you are. So there's there's more we can get into. Like we can go yeah. down any one of these rabbit holes. You know, we could spend two hours on the brain or on the totally. heart or whatever, right? Oh, yeah. So, uh, but this uh, at a high level gives you an idea of the science that powers all the things and who you are, right, in a nutshell. But anyone, even hormones, we could spend a whole day talking about all these nuances on hormones. Totally, yeah. Right? So someone comes to you guys, they do this basic profile like I did, they get this amazing one-on-one. -on -one. This is typical, like what would happen on a, after you, I just want to give the audience kind of an idea. If they come to the DNA company, they run their DNA through you guys, they'll have a consultation like this. And then do you guys then provide like supplements? Is there a separate email gets sent to them with everything that they could possibly do or? Yeah. So what we, what we did was we actually built an AI to allow you to self-interpret, meaning that all these decisions that I just made, our AI does the same thing. And so you get your reports where the interpretations are already built in and you can self-navigate. And it's a lot. Wow. It's literally, there's a couple hundred pages, but it's, it's, <laughs> Wow. But if you start going through it, you'll you'll fly through it because it's it's not a couple hundred pages of heavy dense text. It's more like laid out to show you this and then and so it's it's designed to navigate uh, in six systems: sleep, cardiovascular, diet, nutrition, fitness and hormones, immunity, detox, and inflammation, and mood and behavior, the brain. Yeah. From there, we give everybody one uh, free coach call where the coach will help you navigate your reports, like figure out how do I use this? How do I very easily identify red flags, right? Uh, 
from there, you have the ability to get into coaching programs if you want, meaning that I now see my health from a different perspective. How do I, um, you know, how do I a- apply or these learnings or change what I do? And it's like six week, nine week, 12 week coaching programs because you need to truly change behaviors. And that doesn't happen by us telling you what to do. No. That As happens a coach, by a coach. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we found the sweet spot is nine weeks. So we work with, I think we told you already, we talked about, we work with Dr. BJ Fogg on behavioral yeah. change. And we had him build our actual behavioral change insights and outcomes, our program, sorry, I should say. And we found nine weeks was that sweet spot where no matter who it is, where it was the most proactive CEO or the biggest naysayer, they needed that time to change their identity in whatever it is they're doing and then make it a permanent behavior. Wow. So it's one thing for us to tell you what's going on. It's a whole other thing for us to, you know, get you to actually do the thing. Instead of just putting the drawer in the, in the putting the, the report in your top drawer and never seeing it again, which is typically yeah. what happens, right? That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you because I, I noticed on the website you have the three month program called Gem. Is I'm, I'm assuming that's a pretty popular program as well. After yeah, so done the- we that program. So that that one is like a a high end, call it an executive program, which has a waiting list on it. For us, we put it up there because we have executives that say, "Hey, I want you just do everything," right? Yeah. So our coaching programs are from like three to eight hundred dollars, as an example. This is a five thousand dollar program. It has more demand than the three to eight hundred dollar programs, which we didn't expect, because people once they see their DNA, they start to understand the things we're talking about. Like, well, I I just want to build version two point of myself. Oh yeah. And just do it all. I don't I don't want to pick and choose. Just do it, right? So uh, we were just talking about the conference we were at this weekend. Uh, with JJ Virgin and her team. And we have all these clinicians that came up to us and they signed up. We're like, well, you're doctors. You should already know this stuff. <laughs> they have no clue. They have no clue. So yeah. The actual doctors were signing up for this 5 k program saying, I, I need to understand myself genetically because we aren't taught this stuff. We're only taught it in terms of genetic conditions, sickle cell syndrome, you know, some behavioral, uh, like rare forms of autism, not the majority of it, which is actually what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Things like that. So they don't, they don't get this stuff. So, yeah, it's funny. We that that's where really the the demand seems to be. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Any um, I'm curious. Any amazing testimonials that I I mean, you shared a whole bunch already, but I'm, is there any that like stand out to you that you're like, man, this person was gonna I don't know if anything like they were gonna die or something, and then next thing you know, they were complete 180 in a year or who knows just after getting their results. Does anything stand out to you? Yeah, we. I mean, there's I can think of so many. Um, the first thing I think of is a friend of mine who literally looks like the rock. He looks like the same size, same build. Uh, like he actually looks like him, right? He's never had a drink in his life, never smoked trains regularly. He's got a very successful business where he raises money for real estate uh, development. So he's funded a lot of the large condo projects in Toronto, very successful guy. Uh, and he ran his, I had to push him to get his test done. He wouldn't do it. He's like, I don't, I'm healthy. I don't need it. Yeah. I'm already doing everything right. Uh, that very first thing you said that if you handle everything right, then who cares what my DNA says? I'm doing everything right. That's what I, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Still talking to you. I've completely changed my perspective. So one of our co-founders, so this was early days before I knew much. I wasn't able to interpret. I've now learned it. Right. So his, his results came in. And we get this raw data file that comes that we then have to put through our AI, which populates reports. And at that time, we used to do things manually. We're very new and young as a company. And so one of our co-founders, a guy named Harris, he said, isn't this Joe guy your friend? I was walking by. I said, yeah. He said, this guy's about to have a stroke. (laughs) Yeah. I said, what are you talking about? And he showed me this, this, this. I was like, okay, I don't get it, but I'll call him. He didn't answer the phone. So I call home and his wife answers. And I said, yeah, I just want to talk to Joe about his DNA test. He said, oh, is there anything that we can help with his cardiovascular stuff? I said, what cardiovascular stuff? He said, he's in the hospital. I said, what do you mean? She said, he just had a stroke. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I was like, what is going on? And I, I wasn't, I didn't understand it at the depth I do now. And it had to do with what we talked about, about your cardiovascular profile. He had the same thing up here, the vasculature of the brain. Mm. Highly, highly prone to inflammation. Um, the worst possible 
And based on his age and the and what we knew of his lifestyle, the way he exercised, we used to ask a lot of questions in those days. Now we do a clinical thing. So we had his data in terms of how he exercised. How he, so we calculated that load. It pointed to stroke. And he was at the age where now the, the clock was ticking and this was the time. Wow. So my friend, my partner, or co-founder was advising me to change his exercise, change the way he ate based on what we understood. Uh, it was too late. So now we have a guy who came out of the stroke. Uh, good news is it wasn't heavy. Like he was, he was, he was in the hospital for a while, but he's like, he was active. Right. And had he now knew that missing piece where he actually had to focus what, where he needed to supplement what was wrong right um and thank god he's healthy yeah you know, I, and i can't tell you how many stories like that we have over and over and we can keep going all day if you want yeah <laughs> that's so cool thank you thanks thanks, yeah. thanks for what you guys are doing man no. um, just one more question and then we'll jump into some lightning round questions and uh wrap it up Sure. Any exciting projects that you guys are working on right now? I mean, you guys are doing a lot, but anything? Yeah, so what we've done is because we understand the what we call the phenotype so well, meaning that um, your here's your list of genes. That's your genotype, right? What does that equal? Net result? That's your phenotype. My nose is this long. My hair is this color. That's a phenotype. So we're the only company in the world that has met all of our patients. So we've actually interviewed them like this and documented all those phenotypes which has led us to a phenotypic assessment. Mm. I can, like you said, like, you know, when I just, I looked at you and, and knew things. Yeah. That so we really now cool. can simply ask you questions and assume your DNA. And we've, we filed a patent for this. We built an AI for it. And we're now piloting it with a few companies where, uh, are you familiar with the chili pad? Yeah. Right. So those guys, uh, so they help with sleep. So we said we can help you do a better job and they launched it to their community and a bunch of people used it. And now they've understood the genetics of their sleep without even doing a DNA test. Mm. So the difference is, of course, it's not as precise as DNA and we can't get into as many details as we can with the DNA, but it allows us to get out to people who have an audience in the community that to even help them understand that DNA is something they should be looking at in this context. Right, not my BRCA gene, and I got eighty percent chance of cancer, but I can actually impact what I'm doing today. So that has made a, a that's a huge thing that we sort of just finished working on launch. But other than that, um, the the reports and the sort of consumer friendly, I can use it myself, and I don't need a scientist to interpret it for me. And it's not heavy. You know, we launched that in June. We then got a whole bunch of feedback, revamped it again, and I have relaunched it as of last week. And we're now pushing heavy to sort of get it out there and kind of normalize DNA. Everybody needs to know that this is a thing you can do to understand how to be healthy. Yeah. Right. So cool, man. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Um, real quick, I just thought of something before we go to lightning round of questions. The whole thing around COVID, did we cover that? I just want to make sure. Was that what you were you were going to talk about the whole cardiovascular thing, or was there anything else you noticed over the last year or two years from doing genetic testing with people maybe more susceptible to COVID. I'm just curious. That's a hot topic nowadays. So I'm yeah, there's, there's a couple of layers. Like there's, there's, there's the actual ACE gene, which I told you deals with hypertension for you, which you're not doing so well. Yeah. It also That's determines true. yeah <laughs> how <laughs> quickly the uh, virus can sort of spread, mm. right? That, that receptor is how uh, COVID actually uh, sort of, injects its RNA into your cell, right? So that's the process that needs that gene. And if you have the fast version, you're doing that thing very fast. So you're an ultra internal spreader. So there's some people that get really, really sick. And I'm not talking about, I in the ICU, I'm talking about I got a very, very bad COVID flu, mm. right? It's If you have that fast version of the ACE, you're gonna, it's just gonna bind so much easier and faster and you're gonna get that much heavier expression of the virus. Then there's respiratory and cardiac inflammation. So we, we can predict who's going to end up in the ICU. Yeah. And we've actually built an assessment for that. So it's not only a DNA test, but we can ask you uh, questions that will point to your genetic risk. And this is a unique thing that we built. Um, and so we've been piloting it with some clinics. Um, we actually work with IBM on this. They, they have an AI platform 
um, and we uh, we plug the questions into it, and we're trying to make it more intelligent so that healthcare systems can use it, etc. Because if we know in advance how sick someone's going to get, why why not give someone that info so they know what to do about it? Yeah. Vitamin D response is another big one for the people like yourself that don't transport vitamin D. You you're at risk of a more sort of severe outcome because the cells are already under so much load. Mitochondrial health. If somebody has poor mitochondrial health, they're going to get more sick. Yeah. Because the cells are all already under so much stress and pressure, they can't cope with this additional load that's been thrown at them. So those multiple layers uh, in how we look at COVID. And now, of course, people are asking us questions about vaccine and how does it affect me, you know, and there's a lot. I mean, that's a whole other topic. We can spend a couple sure. hours there. But yeah. the one, a couple key things I would sort of jump on is detox and methylation to so your anti-inflammatory response, uh, your ability to deal with whatever you think may be in there that could cause you a problem, the ability to clear that. Uh, so if you are a poor detoxer genetically, which we can predetermine, what should you be supplementing with in order to support in addition, right? Um, if you are a poor methylator and you're going to get an inflammatory response, so what should you be doing to support that? So if you're worried about some of these younger men who end up with cardiac you know, inflammation. Yeah, the myocarditis, yeah. Yes. So what can you be doing to prevent that? There's things that we know you can be doing, right? So there's, there's a lot. We just, when it comes to that, there's so many things we need to talk about. We just need to ask the right question. Yeah. And then we typically have some kind of input, you know, uh, but there's a, there's a lot. Yeah, that's awesome. Great stuff. Yeah. All right, let's jump into some lightning round questions and sure. uh, get you out of here. I appreciate your time. Um, you ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. All right. If the old you could see the new you, what would the new you say? Oh, wow. New, new you, would, new me would say start earlier. <laughs> and you're a risk taker. So yeah. I mean, even that would still be your advice. Like, get, go sooner. Just do it. Just start earlier. Love that. What um what are some choices that you made that you think made you who you are today? Uh, I think a couple of big ones were, uh, you know, earlier on, and I know this is light year now. I'm sorry, I got to move quicker. But I I had to take responsibility for my family because my father passed away when I was really young. Mm. So that choice to like leave school and work and take care of everybody, that molded me. I would be an engineer somewhere. And not be doing this right now if I want a different path. That's amazing. Yeah. Who um who's someone in the health and you know you guys are at the forefront of health and wellness, but who's someone that inspires you in the health and wellness world? Uh, inspires me. So I recently heard Molly Malou speak, and she blew my mind. That woman is so intelligent, and there's so much stuff in here. I don't know how it fits. She, like there when you see somebody like that that's like special i would recommend people just go to some of her youtube videos and stuff we haven't done any work with her in any way yeah but i just heard her speak a couple times it's like wow i wish i could retain information like that so cool yeah speaking of uh, information any any books that you'd recommend or like i'm a big reader is there like a top one to three books that jump out at you that you impacted your life that you'd recommend other people read so impact my life very very early on i had to learn how to sell you know uh the technique the technique because i had to be able to, like i said support the family and i realized i had been kind of in school and not knowing so i wrote a book called how to close uh, sorry it was i think it was literally called how to close any deal ah. right and it was and from that learning how selling persuasion uh, relationships it's not just uh, intuitive it's technical yeah right and the technique behind how you actually get and it's not that you can convince something to do something somebody to do something that they weren't going to you can just help them get there a lot faster yeah right so I read a couple books along those lines um, and yeah that I think that also helped mold me and who and what I do for sure yeah yeah and then any uh, any rituals or hacks or practices that you do on a regular basis? Yeah, so um, for me, 
so I have a religious background. My family is Muslim, right? We have an Islamic culture. And I did things as dogma. Like we had to pray, we had to fast, we had to do a lot of different things. And I never tied the benefit to me to it. It was more like I had to do it. You know, scared of going to hell, wish I could go to heaven type of thing. Yeah, yeah. And once I started to understand actually through the biohacking world, teaching me what those things were actually for, mm. I did them with intention and purpose and drew the benefit out of them. And to answer your question, prayer, which is essentially meditation, right? Yeah. I didn't understand why we were meant to break and pray five times a day and connect to the energy around us and to everything. And now that I know that it fulfills a purpose here in this world, I do it with purpose and it's, it changes me. Right. So that yeah. understanding that like Mark Hyman talks about how meditation is such an important part of health. You know, a lot of people talk about it, but doing it with intent, with connection, like how do I become part of the fabric of this universe takes you to a level where nothing matters anymore. You know, it's kind of like, I feel like Elon Musk believing that I'm living in a simulation. Like it just, yeah. nothing matters. You know, you can do whatever I want. That's amazing. Well, I mean, because you're so driven, you're so in tune and aligned with your true self. So it, it's not even work. You're just, yeah. you're just, you're just being, you're flowing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Um, two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Sure. Finish this sentence for me. 2020 was a crazy year because of everything going on. So finish this sentence in a different, let's reframe it. 2020 was the greatest gift because dot, dot, dot. So 2020 was the greatest gift because in our business, I discovered that we do so much more than what I thought we did because of COVID, ah. you know, uh, because we had to shift gears. We were closed just like anybody else. And we said, okay, let's figure out what we do here. And I realized at that point that our industry thought in genetic buckets and didn't come out of it. But now that the, the challenge of COVID was thrown at us, we had to reinterpret genetics for that problem. Mm. That's when I realized we can do that for any problem. And this yeah. silo that we were forced in, of you do genetics, right? And we were only working on genetic problems, which is what everybody does. We didn't have to do that. We could look at diabetes, cardiovascular, aging, all the things we've been talking about and reinterpret for that purpose, which, and that's what makes us different than the entire industry. And it happened because of that. Beautiful. Kashif Khan, where can people find you? Uh, the DNA company.com, the website, uh, Instagram. I think we're DNA co the DNA co I am cash con official K A S H K H A N cash con official. There's, we post a lot of videos and things that people want to learn more. Uh, if you want to talk to me directly, just go through the website, email, they'll connect you to me, any questions, whatever you need to know. Awesome, brother. Thanks for being on the show, man. Appreciate Thank you. It was a pleasure.